church. Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. We welcome you as you've come together to celebrate your faith today. And we're glad that you're here. Uh, just a reminder, if you haven't, uh, register your attendance in the attendance pad and leave that attendance pad at the end of the pew. We'd appreciate that. Just a few things uh, I want to mention to you this morning. Uh, right after worship downstairs in Fellowship Paul is our dessert auction. And the proceeds of the, des of the dessert auction uh, will go to support Celebration of Mission event. And, um, and, and I understand there's some pretty rocking items down there that you might want to be interested in. And, and I've already got, I've already heard the news. I've, I may have to save up my lunch money for the next two or three months so I can take care of this one item that I need. I need it badly. Uh, also, I want to mention to you that, that the United Women in Faith um, will be having a picnic uh, on June 5th at noon at the North Buchanan Park. Uh, there's a couple of usher training opportunities listed in the bulletin. And also there is listed in the bulletin uh, the needs for uh, the month of June uh, for the parish house. And let's see. Um, also, Grief Share will be coming after the 4th of July. And if you're interested in that, let us know so we can get you uh, the information about that. Um, and I ask that you would be in prayer this coming weekend, beginning Thursday. Uh, the West Virginia Annual Conference will be in session from Thursday through next Sunday. Uh, so keep the annual conference in your prayer. Uh, our bishop, our district superintendent, and the cabinet uh, as we go about the work of the church. I'm so glad you're here today. I'm very thankful for you, for your presence. And as you are together this morning, may you know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are welcomed in the family of God. Let the worship begin. Good morning. Would you stand and join me in the choral call to worship hymn number 367, He Touched Me.
Please join me in the call to worship. Come, quench your thirst in the love of God. We come for a place in which we can be gently nourished. Be like trees planted by the streams of living water, ready to receive God's nourishment. Strengthen us, O God, to receive your blessed peace. And let us pray. O God, who lifts us up, sets us free, and watches over us, visit us this day. Lift our spirits and free our minds. Open our eyes and hearts to your words, your will, and the miracle of your holy presence with this holy meal. May we encounter you in the meeting of friends, in our kindness to strangers, and in the bread and cup. Lift us up, draw us to you, and set us free, O God. Watch over us, we pray. Amen. And now let's join in the hymn of celebration number 451, Be Thou My Vision. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Please join me responsively in the litany of confession. Too often, our hearts are cold and without gratitude. Too often, our hands are passive and unwilling to carry out acts of mercy. Too often, our lips are pursed tightly, unwilling to speak kind words of love. Too often, we are stubborn and self-centered, separated from our better self and others, separated and alienated from God. Let us confess our separation and alienation from our better selves, from one another, and from God. In Jesus Christ, God broke the barrier of sin and pain that separates us from ourselves, our neighbor, and God, the one who loves us the most. We seek God's grace so we might move from alienation to new life. So God, grant us new life in you. When we deny your presence in our busy days, O oh God, grant us new life in you. When we feel justified in our anger and resentment toward others, O oh God, grant us new life in you. When we judge others before looking at ourselves, O oh God, grant us new life in you. When we occupy ourselves in worldly matters 
and reject your peace and assurance. O oh God, grant us new life in you. When we refuse to follow your will because we are fearful and untrusting, O oh God, grant us new life in you. When we seek the security of false gods and turn our faces from your light, O oh God, grant us new life in you. There is no greater joy in the heart of God than this moment now. For in this moment, we call upon God to grant us new life in the center of our wounded hearts. It is with great joy that God grants us new life and forgiveness of our sin. In the name of Jesus Christ, by grace we are forgiven. With great joy, we are made alive. Thanks be to God. Amen. And would you stay seated and join me in the hymn of, in the hymn of response, Hymn of Promise, number 707. As the ushers come forward this morning, hear these words of invitation. No matter what we are carrying this morning or what we face, we are not alone. At this moment in our worship, we're invited to share what we have so that others will find the same welcome and the same joy that we have known. Let us pray. Gracious God, 
<clears throat> in all of your omniscience, we offer our gifts today. Just as you intimately know us, help us understand and trust in your vastness. As we reflect on our faith, may our stewardship reflect our trust in your guiding hand. Guide us to embody our creed, living as a community of faith in love, service, and action. Though your essence surpasses our comprehension, we find comfort in our relationship with you. As we declare our faith, may it ignite our actions, echoing your love and care for all creation. Bless these offerings as a symbol of our commitment to live out our beliefs. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. The text for today's sermon comes to us from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more? 
Well, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience of, from dead works to worship the living God. For this reason, he is, the mod, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, because a death has incurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. The word of God for God's people this day. Thanks be to God. And as we sing all things bright and beautiful, I invite the kids to come and join me for wiggle time. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. Good, good, good. good. This, is, this was your first week out of school, right? Well, that sounds pretty good. Not yet? Not for you? Uh, come here. Two more days. Well, it'll, it'll, it'll be here before you know it. I want you to do something for me this morning. I want you to take your hand. And very gently place it on your cheek. I'll remember that, okay? Okay, you can take it down now. When I was at another appointment along oh, several years ago, there was a lady there whose name was Margaret Willard. And Margaret, I think, was a, a retired school teacher. And when she retired from school teaching, she decided to do a children's church at the church where I was appointed. And, well, she had done it for years and years and years. And she was, she was the neatest lady. She had written me two or three cards, and every card, well, her handwriting was absolutely perfect. Perfect handwriting. And when she came to church on Sunday morning, she would shake your hand. And when she shook your hand she would leave in your hand a piece of candy. And then what she would do is she would take her hand and place it on your cheek and would say, bless you. Well, Margaret did that. In fact, I started finding out more about Margaret. She had done that for years and years. And in fact, there were, there were young couples that were coming back to, my, to the church and they wanted to be married at that church. And you know the reason why they wanted to be married at that church? Because they went to Mrs. Willard's children's church. That made such an impact on her life. And one of the neat things about Mrs. Willard was she wore the same Easter bonnet for over 50 years. Can you believe that? Well, when, when Mrs. Willard became sick a, a, a little, just a little while before she died, I, I went to see her, and she wasn't able to talk. And but when I walked in, she, she, I know she recognized me. And, and so we, I was getting ready to go, and I said, Mrs. Willard, can I have a prayer with you? And of course, she didn't respond. And I had the prayer. And when I got ready to leave, do you know what she did? 
she took her hand and she placed her hand on my cheek and I could remember all those years of her saying, bless you, bless you. It's a real blessing for us to be together on Sunday mornings and it's a real blessing for us to be able to receive the sacrament of, of communion uh, on Sunday mornings, the bread and the grape juice that reminds us that Jesus blesses us with life everlasting. So if you get a little lonely this week, or maybe you just want to feel warm inside, take your hand and place it on your cheek and just imagine God saying, what? Bless you. Let's have a prayer. Oh, God, I thank you for all these little people that are my close, close friends. Bless them. Bless their families. And bless us, oh, Lord, as, as these little ones become the leaders of our, of our uh, church family. Help us to follow them with their innocence and their love, their joy and their enthusiasm. And, oh, God, we pray this day that you would bless us. Amen. All right, guys, let's practice. Bless you. Thanks for coming up today. Have a great day. I think you guys are going to children's church, right? Hmm? I can't give it to you. My wife gave it to me for Christmas. But I like your Pittsburgh Pirates shirt. Thanks for coming up, guys. You got it? You good? All right.
Uh, there's a story about a seminary student who once very innocently asked his theology professor, where was the Garden of Eden? And the brilliant teacher put down his pen and he turned towards the seminarian and replied, I can tell you exactly where Eden was. In Tennessee. Excuse me? I think I heard you say Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee, he said, 215 South Elm Street. And it was there on Elm Street when I was a boy that I stole a quarter from my mama's purse and ran to the store and bought a bag of peanut clusters and ate them as fast as I could. And afterwards, I was so ashamed that I came back to 215 Elm Street and hid in the closet. And mama found me and asked, what are you, why are you hiding? What have you done? And then the professor asks, need any help locating your own Eden? It's the place where you first betrayed God. Your Eden was that moment when you first discovered that you suffered from a curvature of the soul, our sin. For us to realize the rich depth and width of our Christian faith, we begin by remembering the biblical record from Eden, where Adam and Eve enjoyed a carefree existence in Eden to the forbidden fruit, to Patmos, where Revelations John had a vision of a new heaven and a new earth, there are some who may imagine that our faith began with Jesus and the 12 disciples. Or even with Paul and the apostles as they worked to live into the life of the early church and to bring meaning to Christ's life and death and resurrection. Paul would say that our faith started at least as far back as Abraham. 
when God chose the Hebrew people to be God's own people. And it's true. Our faith did begin with the covenant made with God's chosen people, the people of Israel. And later, Moses sealed that covenant with the blood of an animal. And half of it was sprinkled on the altar, and half of it was sprinkled on the people, which could be a foreshadowing of baptism. Sprinkled that on to the people as a sign that God would be faithful to God's people and God's people would be, were to be faithful to God. And Jesus affirmed that covenant at the Last Supper. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many. So the Christian faith is best understood as a continuation of the covenant relationship between God and God's people through Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews sums it all up when he says, For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more? Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? Through the spirit, Christ offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice freeing us from all those dead in efforts to make ourselves respectable so that we can live all out for God. Now, it, now it, it might be a little difficult for some of us to connect with some of those ancient images and concepts. Animal sacrifice, Blood sprinkled on the altar, sanctified, purified, dead works. What does it all mean? In the 21st century, what's all this have to do with contemporary Christians? Well, for one thing, it indicates to us that God is proactive. Now, proactive means you don't sit around waiting for life to come to you. You take the initiative. We can react to life, or we can face life proactively. God is a proactive God. Thank God. That God does not wait on us to come to God. God comes to us. Think of some of the wonderful images of Jesus. The good shepherd with a lost lamb carried across his shoulders. Christ standing patiently knocking on a door, the door of our heart, a door that must be opened from the inside. God does not wait for us to come penitently seeking God's forgiveness. God takes the initiative. Just as God came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden, or the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to find the one lost sheep, so God comes looking, searching for us. I don't know if you all remember him or not. Uh, do you all remember Graham Kerr? He, he used to be on public television. Um, I watched him. I'm, I'm, I mean, he was, he was funny. And, and the food he made looked pretty good. 
but they called him the Galloping Gourmet. And his television show was several years ago. But anyway, Kerr was successful, famous. He was larger than life, a life that many might envy. But privately, he endured the agony of watching his lovely life, Trina, deteriorate emotionally and physically to the point that heavy medication was her only hope against being institutionalized. And there was one other person who witnessed the sad life in the Kerr household. Her name was Ruthie Turner. It was Kerr's maid. And Ruthie asked her church to pray for Trina. Doctors, therapy, and a devoted husband seemed to have no power to help her. But Ruthie knew that God was faithful. Defiantly and angrily, Trina dared God to deal with her problems. But the next week, Trina went to church with Ruthie. And it was there with the family of God that she was overcome with emotion and God's love for her. And she invited God into her life. And long story short, Trina was baptized in that church where the people were praying for her. Trina began reading the Bible and she stopped the medications and never once suffered from withdrawal. Trina changed in profound ways, recovering her emotional balance, finding a sense of peace and happiness that had been absent for years. The doctor who treated Trina called her restoration a miracle. Trina Kerr called out to God, and God restored her. And what Trina needed to know was that God had always loved her. Loved her. She did not need to come seeking God because God was already there. All she needed to do was to open the door at the sound of God's knocking. And one of the ways God came knocking was to the concern of Ruthie, Trina's maid, and the prayers of the family of God. That's not unusual. Because God will use whatever tool is at hand to speak to us. God is proactive. God takes the initiative. God comes to us before we ever go to God. And another thing we need to know is that our sin does not cancel the covenant, nor does it cause God to stop loving us. You see, there's nothing you can do that would cause God to stop loving you any less. And there's nothing you could do that would cause God to love you more. Stop trying to walk on water. You don't need to make God love you. That's where the Pharisees went wrong. They were good people. They were pillars of the temple, righteous, right-living choir boys. But they couldn't make God love them anymore. And nor can we. Why else? Why else would God empty out the life of the only son for them? God loves people like God loves people like you. God loves people like me. 
Live your life like you're exactly who God says you are. You're God's beloved child. And stop acting like you can or have to earn it. Because, my dear sisters and brothers, that's what the cross is about. The sacrifice of Jesus makes us acceptable to God. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made pure as snow. Not because of anything we have done, but because of the cruciform Christ has done for us through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And so that we are never alone, that we never feel abandoned, God in God's great love and faithfulness sent us the Holy Spirit, a comforter. We've been singing what a friend we have in Jesus for years. And it's true. Jesus is our advocate. The one who intercedes for us and says, my child is not accountable for his or her misdoings. And all of heaven and earth know that this is true. Why are we not accountable? <coughs> Because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Now, this may say, may sound a little, a little like old fashioned imagery. <laughs> but I want to tell you, this is so very important. And if you haven't already, one of these days you will realize that all you really needed to know about Jesus, you probably learned it in Sunday school. There are many people who feel unworthy of God's love. I have done great wrong in my past. Some of them will say, how can God ever love me? I've been unfaithful to my spouse. I've done some really terrible things. I'm a thief. I'm a liar. How can God love me? But that's the whole point of this covenant relationship. God's grace is the crux, the very core of the Christian faith. Paul affirms this covenant relationship when he writes in Romans 8 for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord absolutely Nothing can get between us and God's saving grace. Because God is a proactive God. Even our sin cannot cancel out that relationship. Well, so what, Steve? <laughs> How should we respond to this durable covenant relationship with God and God's saving grace? Well, we open ourselves to God's love so that God becomes our refuge. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. 
Yes, because God's your refuge. The living God is your very own home. Evil can't, can't get close to you. Harm can't get through the door. God ordered the angels to guard you wherever you go. If you stumble, they'll catch you. Their job is to keep you from falling. You will walk unharmed along your journey. And our response is to accept and receive God's gift of grace and to keep accepting and receiving God's grace day after day after day, hour by hour even. One writer writes, I made hundreds of decisions to become a Christian to re-become a Christian, to rededicate my life to God, to rededicate my rededication, to go into full-time Christian service, to treat my parents better, to give I meant to, to, to and I meant every one of those decisions he said. Yet I successfully acted on most of them for only two or three days. And still those two or three days laid the groundwork for the next decision. I couldn't have made the next decision if I had not made the previous decision. I was growing. Growing one decision at a time. No question about it. My growing looked inconsistent. Two steps backward, one step forward, up and down, in and out, over and under. But I was growing all the time. When we accept and receive God's gift of grace, we live into the life that God has for us. God has already covered us with grace in advance because whether or not we believe in God, God believes in us. God knows that there is within us the potential for good and gracious lives. So God does not wait. God proactively moves toward us. Even our most despicable sin does not keep God from seeking us. Today at this table, we remember and give thanks that God so loved us that Jesus Christ has taken away the sins of the world. And our response to God's love is the joy of salvation and faithfulness to God's grace and loving and his loving presence in our lives. It's funny, just before church, uh, Evie and I were discussing cereals. When, when Kellogg's, the cereal company, found that the sales of their cornflakes were sagging, they established <coughs> an advertising campaign. And in this new campaign, people were told to taste them again for the very first time. Cornflakes. Taste them again for the very first time. You know, a relationship with Christ can be like that. 
If your Christian life has become dry and stale and sagging and average and chilly, maybe it's time that you get to know Christ again for the very first time. Jesus is not repelled by us. No matter how messy we are and regardless of how incomplete we are, when we recognize that Jesus is not discouraged by our humanity, is not turned off that he's not turned off by our messiness. The proactive God simply and doggedly pursues us in the face of it all. What else can we do but give in to God's outrageous, indiscriminate grace and faithfully follow Jesus? One of my favorite writers is Michael Iaconelli, who died a few years ago in an auto accident. Mike writes one of his books, well, actually it's one of my very favorite books entitled Messy Spirituality. And he writes in that book, a few years ago, I was introduced to a group of uncouth Christians who call themselves the notorious sinners. These are men from all walks of life who meet once a year to openly share their messy spirituality with each other. The title, Notorious Sinners, refers to the scandalous category of forgiven sinners whose reputations and ongoing flaws didn't seem to keep Jesus away. In fact, Jesus had a habit of collecting disreputables. He called them disciples. And that's what he still calls us sinners. I like people who openly admit their notoriousness, people who unabashedly confess they are hopelessly flawed and hopelessly forgiven. And Iaconelli says, Graciously, these men invited me to be a part of their group. The notorious sinners met yearly at spiritual retreat centers where from the moment we arrive, we find ourselves in trouble with the sinner's leadership. We don't act like most contemplatives who come to spiritual retreat centers, you know, reserved and quiet and silently seeking the voice of God. We're a different kind of contemplative, earthly, Boisterous, noisy, and rowdy, try, tramping or tromping around our souls, seeking God, hanging out with a rambunctious Jesus who was looking for a good time in our hearts. He says, A number of us smoke cigars. About half are recovering alcoholics, and a couple of the men could embarrass a sailor with their language. Two of the notorious sinners show up on their Harleys, complete with leather pants and leather jackets. He says, I admit I run with a rough crowd, Christians whose discipleship is blatantly real and carelessly passionate, characterized by a bold godliness unafraid to admit their flaws, unintimidated by Christians who deny their own messiness. These guys sometimes look like pagans and other times look like Jesus. They're spiritual troublemakers, really, which is why they look like Jesus who was always causing trouble himself. 
And then Michael Iaconelli unintentionally gives a a portrayal of so many of us who are trying to follow Jesus the best they can. They are full of mischief, laughter, and boisterous behavior, which is why they look like pagans, truly messy disciples. The notorious sinners are definitely a bizarre mix of the good, the bad, and the ugly, living a spirituality which defies simple definitions. Oh, he says, and they are some of the most spiritual men I know. Jesus will be with you as you receive the elements of Christ's table. And Jesus embraces you as he has so many times. At that very moment, Jesus will embrace you just the way you are. So open your hearts to receive him. And the gift of God's saving grace, like it was the first time. And maybe it's time to renew our relationship with God here at the table. Amen.
when Jesus sat at table and ate with tax collectors and sinners. He proclaimed that God's care knows no bounds. We proclaim again the comfort and challenge of the witness. Everyone is invited now to share God's table and be nourished by the bread of life. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us thank God. We thank you, God, that you have provided for all the worlds that ever were or will be by giving yourself to them in love. If we go to the heights of the mountains or if we make the grave our bed, you are with us. If we go to the depths of the sea, your right hand holds us fast. We thank you for Jesus, your word, who lived among us, uncovering your presence. We thank you that you stamped his death with victory and that life, not death, was the final word. We ask now that you bless us as we share this bread and cup that we might be nourished by that same unbounded love and so be encouraged to be your servants to the world. And now, as your daughters and sons whom you have reconciled to yourself, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. As Dan plays the communion meditation on the organ, you are invited to come to the altar to stand, to kneel, and to pray.
Our closing hymn of dedication this morning is Rise Up, Ye Saints of God, as we stand and sing together. And you don't want to forget the auction downstairs for Celebration of Mission event. I'm sure there's some goodies down there. Receive these. Let us pray together. Thank you, God, for renewing us at your table by the presence of Jesus. Thank you for your eternal love, the bread of life that sustains all creation. May you continue to love us in our faithful acts. And by that love, discourage us from our unfaithful acts that we might rejoice as your followers in the world. Amen.